This is Teresa Matsura, and you're listening to Uncanny Japan. While strolling through the grounds of a Japanese temple or shrine, you have no doubt seen the endearing sight of statues decked out in red bibs. But why? I think I might have touched on this when I talked about Ojizo statues back in episode 26 or 27. But that was four years ago, and this is four years later. And the more I read about the topic, the more I realize there are a lot of different things going on here. So today, let's look into why all the red bibs Would you like to explore the stranger, more obscure corners of Japanese culture? Dig a little deeper into superstitions, curious customs, and all those mysterious creatures that inhabit the land? If so, then this is the podcast for you. Uncanny Japan is where I, author Teresa Matsura, share all the fascinating tidbits I unearth while doing research for my writing. From the bizarre to the ghastly, and everything in between. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, hey, how are you? Getting excited about the new year coming up? 2023, the year of the rabbit. Yeah, me too. What could possibly go wrong in the year of the harmless little bunny? I mean, what's it going to do? Nibble your bum? Anyway, this episode is dedicated to my patron, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying, Friend Andy. I put up a video I made of a day trip to the Toyokawa Inari Kitsune Shrine over on Patreon, and Andy asked a seemingly straightforward question. Why are all the foxes wearing red bibs? It's usually something you see with Ojizo statues, but Kitsune? I couldn't answer. I asked some of my Japanese friends who also thought it was a very good question, and they couldn't answer either. Andy sent me a link he found, and that got me started. So thank you, Andy, for getting me excited about a topic, and also congratulations, too. You see, he's a Buddhist monk, and after many years of study and practice, just recently received the Dharma transmission from his teacher. That means he is the successor in an unbroken lineage of teachers. I learned from him about Kechi Myaku, which literally means blood pulse, but it means spiritual bloodline. This means you can trace the lineage all the way back to the big guy himself, Siddhartha Gautama. Imagine being on that spiritual family tree. So omedeito gozaimasu, koku-san. And thank you for the nudge into the fox bib mystery. So here we go. Bibs. A bib as you'd buy it or make it for your baby in Japanese is called yodare kake. Yodare is a great sounding word for drool. Kake means to hang, so a piece of cloth that hangs around your neck to catch the drool. Because a literal translation here would be hanging drool or drool hanging. And I think we can all agree that that's just gross. Since the image of a statue drooling is also more than a little unnerving, the name for this garment, as it's used on stone or wooden figures, is also different. When you're talking about a bib on an ojizo or a fox, you'd call it mai kake. Mai means before or in front of, and again kake to hang. But wait a minute, you say. A mai kake is the Japanese word for apron. Which means those aren't bibs at all. They're aprons. But that does make sense. Of course, there are aprons for people that go just around the waist. And ojizo, and foxes for that matter, sitting on their stone plinths, don't usually have waists. So you might want to tie the maikake a little higher up around the neck to keep it secure. Which, theoretically, would end this episode because the answer to why all the red bibs is... They're not bibs, they're aprons. So thank you for listening. I'm kidding. They actually are kind of bibs too. 
And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that they've been said to be symbolic of a Buddhist monk's robes as well. This is what we know. Let's start with Ojizo. Again, hop back to episodes 26 and 27 for more on them. Very briefly, Ojizo are those sweet-faced, kind-hearted statues you can find on temple grounds or crossroads or, well, various places. There's one on the long version of my walk, and it's just sitting by a river under a little shelter, not a temple or crossroad in sight. Their history is long and fascinating, but remember, they are the protectors of children, especially children or babies who have died. These children could have died in a dozen different ways. Life was hard back then. Miscarriages, stillbirths, any number of diseases, accidents. Often, children weren't even named until their first birthday because, I was told, you don't want to get too attached to them. You didn't know when they'd be called back home, so to speak. So there was definitely a need to grieve for these little ones. And this Ojizo tradition helped the belief being that they are now on a riverbank limbo, or Saino Kawara. Here they must stack stones all day long, a kind of penance, a way of getting into heaven. At night, unruly and beastly oni sweep down from the mountains and knock over the stacked stones with their iron clubs. Ojizo can also swoop in, but their intention is to hide the little children under their robes and protect them from the oni, or help them across the river so you can see why parents would want to incur some favor from their local ojizo. Please help my child. This is why you'll sometimes find offerings to ojizo statues, toys, snacks, and pinwheels. Items a child might like. A bib then, too, being something a child would wear, makes sense here. I read in two places something that made sense to me, so I want to mention it. That before people would knit, sew, or crochet their own maikake, specifically to place on a statue, the parents would use one of their own deceased child's bibs. Maybe it was a used bib, maybe not. But as a way for the ojizo to identify that particular child in the underworld, or for that child to find comfort in this little memory of home. Dark, I know, and don't quote me on it, I didn't have time to read around more to see if that's a real thing or not, or just a couple people's theory. But to me it makes sense. If a mother was sewing clothes for her unborn child, and then the absolute worst thing happened, in grief, I could imagine her dressing a kind Ojizo statue into clothes and praying for it to help her baby. So, we have Ojizo statues being outfitted with red bibs and sometimes little red bonnets and Ojizo are of the Buddhist persuasion. What about foxes? Foxes are found on the grounds of a Jinja, or Shinto shrines, and they have nothing to do with going down to the Saino Kawara and protecting children, at least as far as I know. But wait, let's talk for one moment about the color red. You'll find it all through Japanese history, red painted Daruma dolls, red lacquered Neo guardians in the front of temples, Of course, torii gates and shrines are more often than not bright red. When you place your inkon or seal on an important document or work of art, you press it first into some sticky shunmiku or vermilion paste. Red was worn by samurai as a symbol of strength in battle. Red is one of the two colors on the Japanese flag, and it represents the sun. Amaterasu was a sun goddess. Red. Red was thought to have the power to get rid of disease, smallpox, tuberculosis, the measles, and also for ridding us of demons, like the whole Solgami, or the god of smallpox. This might in part have come from red being associated with the fire god. This is back in the 500s and 600s, and of course fire was being used for purification rituals. Purification would protect you from both evil and illness. So red it is. Another line of thought is that when smallpox was ravaging Japan, one's life or death was predicted by the color of the skin. If your disease turned purple, then the outlook was grim. But if it turned red, then recovery was just around the corner. 
So red is connected with expelling demons and disease, which easily moved into the idea of red being a healing color, one that boosted fertility and childbirth even. It's also auspicious and it designates power. You know that old yarn about Eskimos having 50 words for snow? Well, let me tell you some beautiful words for red in the Japanese language that we don't have in the West. I won't list 50, but here are a few that I like to give you an idea. First, there's Hinomaru no Akairo, the color of red used on the Japanese flag. Kobairo, plum red. Sakurairo, cherry blossom red. Tokihairo, ibis swing red. Ebiiro, shrimp red. Otomeiro, maiden red. Terigakiiro, shiny or glazed persimmon red. Mizugakiiro, water persimmon red. Kakishiboiro, the juice of an astringent persimmon red. There's so many more, but I'll end with the ever romantic Umenezumiiro, plum mouse red. Really, I could go on and on. I think Japan's colors for red could give those snow words a run for their money. Anyway, just keep that in mind. While you might run across white or patterned maikake bibs, mostly they're a beautiful bright red. Back to foxes. Very often you'll find foxes with red bibs or aprons tied around their necks as well. Foxes are the messenger for the god Inari Okami, and that's Okami meaning big god, not wolf. Sometimes this god is also called Oinari. Inari-sama is the patron god of fertility, rice, tea, sake, agriculture, industry, and just all-around prosperity and success. Oh, and also protector of warriors and blacksmiths. You've got most of your bases covered when you worship Oinari. There are some correlations here. Red being the color of fertility, and kitsune also helping in this department. I've read again and again that foxes help dispel evil spirits, and of course red is used for this too. So perhaps it was just a natural step to start tying red maikaki around the necks of foxes. Random fox trivia. More of a third of the shrines in Japan are Inari Jinja. And a shrine can be an Inari Jinja and not have a fox statue. As a matter of fact, the one near my house is like that. It's quite small. So I guess it never got any kitsune statues. Although the neighborhood is taking up small monthly donations and have been for years. So at some future date, it's said that it's going to get a big refurbishing. Maybe we'll get a pair of kitsune then. Also, not specifically related to bibs, but I learned that foxes are associated with the kimon. Remember the northeast direction that is thought to be unlucky? A place evil or oni can come storming in. You can find, if you're looking carefully, a kimon direction guarded by a fox or foxes. Actually, the shrine I went to just recently, the well-known Toyokawa Inari Shrine, was a complex of several shrines and temples, but the area with the hundreds of kitsune statues was situated in the back, northeast corner of the entire grounds, protecting the kimon. Some more about red bibs. Sometimes you'll find red maikake around the necks of shishi guardians, those lion dog statues that you see in the front on either side of the gate on the entrance of some jinja or shrines, again to dispel evil. Note at temples you'll find the neo statues, those big fierce looking warriors. And when they're not too old, they're also painted red. So what I'm trying to say here is there are a lot of theories and good ones too. And pretty much, they can all be correct, depending on what point in time you're looking at. No, I don't think statues are adorned in red these days to stave off smallpox, but back in the day. My first thought when Andy asked me about the red bibs on foxes was maybe they're placed on cute images. An ojizo, a fox, the shishi lion dogs, all cute. And something that make us want to take care of them. And while that feels like the right answer because I can't remember seeing a red bib on a Buddha or Fudomyo or Kanon, you know, higher up on the echelon of deities, because they take care of us, it does seem like overwhelmingly Maikake and Bonnets too 
are placed on Ojizo, Kitsune, and the Shishi lion dogs, sometimes called Komainu, which are powerful and protecting and helpful, but also entities a little closer to us humans, something we can care for, and they can care for us back. Which brings me to my final thoughts. A bib or apron or mayakake is a simple garment to make and attach to a statue, a gesture of kindness. So my personal takeaway from living in Japan and trying to be observant and asking a few questions now and again is empathy. Alongside all the reasons I just mentioned is also empathy. When you go outside in the dead of winter and you see a statue of an ojizo or a kitsune and you feel it in your gut, they must be so cold out there, poor things. So you go home and you find some extra cloth, red for good luck and fending off evil, and you sew a mai kake for the little effigy to wear, and maybe you make a little hat too, to keep its head warm. It's just such a sweet thing to do. And others seeing it also feel something at this act of kindness. At least I do. Not knowing who made the garments or dressed the statue, but seeing it taken care of and respected is a very nice thing. And if there's something we could use more of in this world, I would say acts of tenderness and compassion are high on the list. So thank you everyone for listening to the show. One more week and we'll wrap up 2022. Please consider becoming a patron in the new year if you'd like. I just put up a recipe for gohei mochi, a delicious treat I had while visiting the Koranke Gorge a few weeks ago in Aichi. I also put up a video of that in the Toyokawa Inari Shrine I mentioned today. Next year, I'm planning to put up more short videos of interesting and unique places for patrons. So that should be fun. Everyone, please stay safe and well and enjoy the end of the year holidays. I will talk to you again in two weeks. Bye bye. You've reached the end of the show, and I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening and supporting us. Any subscribing, reviewing, and gushing to your friends, family, even random strangers really does help keep us going. If you have the means and you want to help a little more and get a little more, we are making extra content over on Patreon, all for only $5 a month. Or if you like to read horror, you might be interested in my Bram Stoker nominated short story collection, the Carp-Faced Boy and Other Tales. Hontoni arigato gozaimasu. Thank you again, and I'll talk to you real soon.